My name is David Wiley, and uh, for some odd reason, I have the opportunity to welcome you to the meeting today. Uh, just a few words very quickly to contextualize myself. Um, I'm a Shuttleworth Fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation out of Cape Town, which some of you are familiar with. Currently on leave from Brigham Young University, where I'm a faculty member in the Instructional Psychology and Technology Department, leading an organization called Lumen, which helps uh, colleges and universities adopt open educational resources. But the reason I'm standing here right now, I think, is because I'm also the Senior Fellow for Strategy at the Saylor Foundation. And so it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the conference and say a few words to set some context uh, before introducing Michael, who will be here shortly. Um, I hope I don't have to argue this point with you that we live in pretty amazing times. I think that's true for a number of reasons, but the reason I think that's most relevant to our meeting this morning is that I think if we as a group put our collective minds to it, there's literally nothing that we can't do. Anybody want to argue that point? Um, it's really just a matter of creativity and passion and commitment and political will now. There aren't technological barriers in our way, per se. Um, there aren't many barriers that have been in our way in the past. So I think the state that we find ourselves in where it's possible for us to do essentially anything really creates a moral imperative for us to think about if we can do anything, then what are the things that we should do? And I italicize this word, word should because it really is a, it's a pretty strong word. If we can do anything, then what is it that we ought to be doing? How should we be spending our time? Um, if you've been to the Sailor Foundation's website recently, you've seen this kind of motto at the top of their page, harnessing technology to make education free. I think that's absolutely one of the things that we ought to be doing, that we should be doing, and that's what this meeting today is about. Now, I don't have a monitor in front of me, so forgive me as I turn occasionally to reference these slides behind me. Um, I assume I don't have to spend a lot of time on this particular story either. Everybody knows what's happening with the cost, uh, particularly of post-secondary education, uh, up about 500% in the last 30 years compared to about 150% growth in uh, median family income. And we all saw this happen last year as well. Uh, student loan debt crossing the trillion dollar mark for the first time, surpassing both outstanding credit card debt and outstanding mortgage debt, uh, at least in the United States. And everybody knows the important thing that's different uh, between student loan debt and credit card or mortgage debt, right? What is it? Never goes away. Never goes away. You can't get rid of it. Bankruptcy won't get rid of it. There's literally no way to get rid of it. So it really is, um, I have 10 minutes, so I'm not doing it the justice it deserves, but it's really a significant problem that we're looking at. Um, and education is more important to each of us than it ever has been before, not just to us individually, but to us as a society and to a planet as well. The kinds of problems that we're dealing with now, these naughty, uh, thick, difficult problems don't have easy solutions, and they need people who are well-educated to solve and to work on them. So this meeting is important for a handful of reasons, but the one that I want to focus on really has to do with getting people of a particular sort in, all into the same room at one time. Academics are not famous for being particularly business savvy. Can we all agree on that? Okay. Um, can we also all agree that business people are not particularly famous for having a deep understanding of education and the way that learning works? Um, if, if, if you've ever seen somebody from a startup walk into a classroom and tell a teacher of 15 years that she's doing it wrong and let me show you how, um, then you have a sense for this as well. So without uh, both groups bring a particular kind of expertise and both groups really need each other to make progress in the kinds of problems that we're facing and that's why it's important to have us all in the same room at one time. I think it is very much like, you remember those old commercials where the guy's roller skating down the street, eating his chocolate bar? There's a girl with a jar of peanut butter inexplicably eating it with a spoon, walking down the sidewalk, and then he trips and his chocolate lands in her peanut butter. Great commercials. They're available on YouTube if you go look for them hard enough. I, th I really think this is what we're trying to do over the next two days is to put the chocolate in the peanut butter. And if you want education to be the chocolate and business to be the peanut butter, the other way around, you can choose however you, you want that to work. But that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, there are a number of key innovations that are enabling the things that we're trying to do. Some of them are really obvious. Some of them are less obvious. Uh, obviously, internet, broadband, and mobile on the technology side are enabling what we're doing. Innovations in licensing, particularly with the Creative Commons licenses, around making it easier and more legal for us to share with each other in a way 
uh, that can make education free in the way that we're thinking and, and hoping. And also innovations in financing, like this resurgence of the idea of royalty capital that can provide uh, investment funds to companies that really want to be mission-driven, like education startups primarily want to be, without getting in the way of dragging them off course with this push, push, push for, for an exit that you get with traditional capital. There's a lot of things coming together that I think are very interesting that enable the types of work that we want to do. Um, my own particular work, I just want to say three minutes about it and go very quickly just to give some context for the kinds of things that's that are possible. Not to say that my work is the best work and that you should all follow it, but just to lay out some examples. And I'm looking forward over the next uh, two days to hearing examples of the work that, that you're all doing in this same area. So open educational resources by show of hand, if you're familiar with the term. Okay, just about everybody. Awesome. So there if you're familiar with the four R's, right? So open educational resources are materials you have free access to that come with licensed permissions to engage in the four R activities to reuse, revise, re remix, and redistribute them. Um, so one of the things that I think particularly is interesting about the cost problem is that tuition and fees are highly political, but textbook costs have been growing terrifically, that second line down there as well, and textbook costs are actually a fairly straightforward problem to attack. So three specific examples from my own work. First, the, the Kaleidoscope Open Course Initiative, uh, which started a year ago and has gone into community into eight community colleges or open access four-year schools. We've touched about 10,000 students so far. Um, but interestingly, we've taken open educational resources, worked together with faculty to pull those together into textbook replacements, and then made the required cost of textbooks on the syllabus zero dollars for each of these courses. And these are things like intro psych, um, intro to biology, developmental math. Um, driven the cost of textbooks to zero for these courses and seen on average across the 10 courses that we worked in last year, better than a 10% increase in the percentage of students who were completing the course with a C or better. Saving money, improving outcomes. Uh, another project I'm really excited about, one we're launching this fall with Tidewater Community College not too far down the coast from where we are, is uh, an initiative to take an entire associate's degree and move it off of textbooks and onto OER. This is a two-year degree program in business administration. It's about $3,000 a year in tuition. The cost of textbooks over the life of the program is $2,500, $3,000. So by literally taking all the textbook costs out of the degree program, we knock 25 to 30% off the cost of the program. It launches in the fall, so I don't have outcome data for you yet, but it's gonna be very cool. And then a third one that I'll mention very quickly is our Utah Open Textbook Initiative, which is a K-12 initiative where for the last four years, starting in science, we've been working with teachers to replace the typical textbooks that a school or a district would adopt and purchase with openly licensed textbooks. And you can see that these are free to use online. The print-on-demand service that we use this year, the middle school science textbooks were $3.99 a piece. The high school science textbooks were $4.99 a piece. Um, over 90% of the districts uh, in the state of Utah are on either or, uh, you know, open math or open science, and we're moving into open language arts with the Common Core transition this coming fall. And we've just uh, released some data showing statistically significant gains in learning outcomes for students that use open textbooks compared to students that are using the publisher-provided textbooks. And these growth, uh, these changes in growth are on the state standardized test. So, you know, three very quick ways that I'm attacking the problem. I know you're all attacking it in interesting ways, too. Very excited to hear uh, what you're working on. And all these different ways that we're all kind of running up against uh, Michael Saylor's vision of this idea that education should be free and should be available to everyone. Um, and a final word, and I think this is where the chocolate really hits the peanut butter, is that these models can be financially self-sustainable. Uh, right? Everybody knows Red Hat, everybody knows that they work in a space around open source software but still manage to add a lot of value and be a, a very profitable business. So this is not an either or situation where we have to live on grant funding forever and ever. I think we can make this work very sustainable. We need more of these kinds of models, we need more experimentation. So it's my opportunity to introduce Michael Saylor to you now. Um, two things you probably did know uh, about Michael are um, that, of course, that he's the founder and CEO of MicroStrategy, the, the very impressive looking building that we were all just standing in. Um, and also that he has this double major from MIT. 
Something you probably didn't know was that he actually attended MIT on a ROTC scholarship. I, I didn't know that until I started putting these notes together, which I thought was very cool. And of course, you all know that he's very committed and very passionate about this idea that education ought to be free. So uh, with that brief introduction, please join me in welcoming Michael Saylor. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, it's really kind of exciting to have everybody here. Um, the reason we're having the conference is there's just a palpable sense over the past 12 months that, that uh, technology is shifting underneath us in a good way, that awareness of the opportunities of digital education is, is, uh, is growing and it's breaking. Uh, into new areas, new institutions are embracing some of these ideas. Uh, traditional conservative businessmen and conservative politicians who would have dismissed it or not given it a second thought are now starting to think about uh, their digital education strategy and, uh, and all these ideas that seemed, uh, they seemed a bit too forward thinking five years ago or ten years ago, now are looking to be, uh, be uh, I wouldn't say mainstream, but they're looking to be mainstream interesting to the innovators in the society. So if you're an innovator in this culture, you, you have to be considering uh, digital learning and you have to be considering how, how you're going to take advantage of digital technologies to change the way that people learn. And uh, at the same time, uh, it's not like er there's not like there's any institution that seems to have cracked the code. I don't see a state or a federal government, or a corporation, or an institution that's put together all the right pieces, the, uh, the educational assets, and the brand, and the, and, and the methodology, and, the, and, um, and, and uh, the vision such that they could go out and educate millions, or tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of people using digital technology. So th that seems like an ideal time to have a convocation because we're hoping to bring together people, and we said this in our, uh, in our conference header, we said, you know, we're looking for people that have the content, and people have the financing, people have the distribution, people that people are looking for the idea, people have the idea, people want some support for the idea, and uh, I, my agenda for this conference is really just to bring all you together, because I figure someone needs a job, and someone needs to hire somebody, and somebody needs some money, and someone else would like to make an investment in order to get a return, and someone's got some content they'd like to get distributed, and someone else probably has a distribution channel they'd like some content for, and maybe someone has a problem they'd like solved, and someone has a solution, and they wish somebody would listen to them. And, uh, and that's a good uh, time and a good, a good space to be in the marketplace, and that's a time to call a conference. I was saying to uh, some of the employees of the Sailor Foundation just uh, earlier today at the lunch, there's not much point in going to a conference on oil exploration today, you know, at our age, because for 50 years, everybody's decided what they think about that. Unless you have billions of dollars to bring to bear on the problem, then no one really cares what your opinion is. And there are a lot of other mature industries where conferences aren't going to have that much meaningful effect. But we're on the cusp of, of an industry where even one person, even even like any, any two of you that might get together and have a conversation might actually change the world. You might, you might create a company, you might uh, create a new methodology, something might break here. So this seems like, uh, seems like an opportunity worth pursuing and it's a reason to have uh, a conference. Um, I'm like you, looking forward to seeing what comes out of this, but I've got my eyes open. I don't have any, any other particular agenda. I thought I'd share with you just a a few general thoughts, uh, motivations, and, and also expectations and uh, opportunities that I see on the horizon. Uh, and then uh, I, I'll give the floor to people that, that actually have a lot, more, uh, a lot more focus on this and information on this topic than I do. Um, my, own, my own background story, which uh, you just heard a little bit of, is I grew up in a middle class family, actually a lower middle class family. My father was an enlisted man in the Air Force. And uh, I was really the first person in my family, probably for many generations, to actually go to a four year college. And um, when I was a senior in high school, I think my family's net assets were approximately $3,000. We didn't own a house. We probably didn't own a car free and outright. 
uh, we had uh, about enough money that, that after every Christmas vacation, which generally consisted of driving a car, stopping at a Holiday Inn, and, and trying to get to wherever our relatives were in 16 hours uh, of driving on highway, after each one of those vacations, I remember seeing my father, he would sit and balance the checkbook and shake his head and, and sometimes snap at my mother because we stopped and ate at a restaurant twice and we were only supposed to eat once and then complain about how long it was going to take to pay off the vacation, which literally consisted of driving to a national park and walking around and looking at the trees. So it's not like there was any extra money rolling around. And uh, I know for sure, you know, I had this aspiration. I read all these science fiction novels, and MIT was always prominently figured in it as a place where people win if they want to design spaceships and go to Mars and things like that. So I thought I wanted to go to MIT. But uh, MIT cost enough that I would have burned through my entire family's life savings in about the first four weeks. So that wasn't going to happen. And uh, it, it wasn't like it was a student loan burden. There was zero chance in my mind that anyone was going to give me a loan to go to MIT. And if, any, and if anybody did give me a loan sufficient to cover the cost, then I knew there was zero chance I would ever ask my father to co-sign that loan. And, I did, I, and, and if I had got to the point where I, I was presumptuous enough to ask my father to co-sign the loan, I don't think he would have done it. Or a guy that doesn't feel comfortable paying for holiday inns and, and driving through Gatlinburg, Tennessee on, uh, on holiday probably isn't going to pay for the most expensive institution in the country at the time. And so I wouldn't have gone. I, I might have scraped my way through community college, but I wasn't going to go to MIT. Uh, well, unless somebody helped me. And I got some help, and it was actually the Reagan Cold War buildup. Ronald Reagan uh, started building the military back in, uh, in 80. I uh, graduated in 83. It was the height of that buildup. Uh, the number of ROTC scholarships was probably at an all-time high. I basically agreed to indenture myself to the military uh, in return for a free education. They paid my tuition. They gave me a stipend. So it was a lot of money. In today's terms, it'd be about it'd be $250,000. I suppose. And the, the return was, uh, or the agreement was, I'd say there for about f uh, four years as an engineer. After the second year, I decided I want to be a pilot. And then the agreement was I'd be a pilot in the Air Force for 10 years. So I was basically ready to like work off an education for a decade. And then as a fluke, the Cold War ended. And I graduated in 87. And there's just one year, one year that I know of in the history of ROTC where <laughs> where all the ROTC graduates on full ride scholarships were offered the chance to leave the military and go into the reserve, and none of us served the day of active duty. Uh, the year before, if you tried to do that, you would have uh, got court-martialed and gone to jail. We all lived in fear. And the year after that, they fixed all the staffing, and so, the, so everybody went into the military. Just this one year, it's like the cracking of a whip. All these people basically got pushed through the educational establishment, and then we got released. So I was released with a pretty good education. I mean, a better education than anybody in my family had ever had, and a, and a world-class education uh, for that time period. And I had no debt. And so as a result, uh, two years later, when I was, uh, when I was about to uh, start my company, and I, I started, I had basically, um, I, I secured a $250,000 contract with the DuPont Corporation. And I went, and I was so nervous about finances, I borrowed $5,000 from the bank. And, and literally, that's because I had $0, right? So at age 24, you have nothing. So I borrowed 5000 and you can't borrow it against a house. I didn't have a house. I told them I was going to buy furniture from my apartment, and I got an unsecured furniture loan. And then I didn't buy the furniture, which I, 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 I haven't really thought about whether that technically is loan fraud or not loan fraud. Because I don't, it was unsecured. I don't think they required that I give them a vehicle ID or or uh, 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 some kind of leasehold. So I guess it's probably legal. But I ended up with I had five thousand dollars in debt, and I remember that was still kind of burdening on me. And then, I, but but I I mollified myself by thinking, you know, I got this two hundred fifty thousand dollar contract, and I got a hundred thousand in cash up front. Well, at my current rate of cost, that'll last me seven years. So I said, I can go ahead and start this company because I can probably live in a $1,000 a month apartment, share it with another guy. I had milk crates for bookshelves. 
and I'll just scrimp my way through. And if I don't like make it in the first year or two years, I can squeeze to year three or year four. And I got myself all worked up thinking that I could probably make it almost for seven years on that cash before I then had to declare defeat. Uh, and so you could call me like a risk-taking entrepreneur, but the truth of the matter is I got incredibly lucky on two fronts. One front, I just got a gift from the United States military. And even there, it was like a flu, it wasn't even a gift, right? If I'd done what everybody else in the military had done, I wouldn't have been able to start a company. I'd be flying, you know, for Delta Airlines or something right now. And the second gift was I just happened to be in the right place at the right time uh, doing a project, uh, a system dynamics computer simulation project, uh, and I was a specialist, and I just happened to have learned that skill at MIT from guys in the Sun School of Management who would not, would not have taught it to me if I was a community college student back in Ohio, and I couldn't learn any other way. So I got just the, this very lucky access to a skill, and I showed up with no debt, and the combination of having a skill and having no debt, you know, emboldened me to take a risk. And the result is uh, today we have, whatever, 3,500 employees. And, uh, and it's a real business. And we do business everywhere on earth and generate $700 million in revenue. And I, I am by far not the most successful entrepreneur of my generation. But, but the most important point is that building, none of those jobs, Nothing we do would exist had I either not gotten extremely lucky or been in debt when I graduated from high school or from college. Uh, and it didn't matter how motivated I was or how smart I was. I look at, uh, I look at stories today. I just, I just read a story on Bloomberg coming here. I read it on my, I read it on my iPad. <laughs> and the story on Bloomberg was about the, the exploding cost of medical school debt. <laughs> and they, they make a note. They say uh, Ben Bernanke's uh, son, I think, is going to graduate med school with $400,000 in debt. They had, a st they had a story about another guy. He's, he's got $180,000 in debt the third year in the medical school. He's got $50,000 more to go. They said the interest rate on this stuff is 6.8% to 7.9% on a government student loan. They have to pay the interest on the debt for three to seven years of residency. By the way, the United States government borrows money at 1.7 percent, and so and so we charge people four times the U.S. government rate for education that they that's going to be essential for them to make a contribution. You know, and I looked at that and I and I thought, well, let me see what everybody thinks. Right, that ain't right. I mean, how, what's the odds that you're going to go to medical school, walk out with three hundred fifty thousand dollars in loans, and then start a company? Right? I was afraid to start a company with zero debt, right? $350,000 in debt. It's the very, the very people, right, the responsible individuals that the society wants to carry their burden, and, they, and we expect these people to contribute. Anybody that's got all of those societal virtues with that much debt is not going to quit their job, take a mass, massive risk, and try to go do something. And you, you would think, what, if you had a, a wife or children or a husband, or other obligations, and you quit your job to go try something random, you would say, you know, that's totally irresponsible. And by the way, the other dirty secret I'll tell you, which everybody probably knows, is, is, uh, is not just it's risky, it's, just, it's very unlikely to succeed. You start a company one in a hundred times, doesn't work out the way you wanted. And I, I went public, our company went public in uh, 1998. I rang the opening bell of NASDAQ 10 years later. And uh, I got beat up a lot. The company got beat up a lot. We went back and forth, up and down, but, but we, uh, we fought our way through. And 10 years later, we we're like three, four times bigger. And uh, one of the investment bankers that took us public, he looks at me and he goes, so Mike, you've been uh, a public company CEO for 10 years. What did you learn? And I said, I scratched my head and I thought about it. I said, you know, it occurs to me there were 100 companies I was competing against in 1998, and I'm the only CEO that still has his job. 99% mortality rate, and, that, and generally when you get public, people consider that to be like success. But the point really is there's a very high mortality rate when it comes to pursuing a new idea in science or in business or in politics. And uh, the thing, one of the things that holds us back is, is that debt and the inability to fail. 
It's one thing to fail and have to live in an apartment for three years. It's another thing to fail and not be able to pay for health care for your kids or not be able to pay for, you know, fill in the blank, right? There's a lot of things that, that uh, are a lot more emotionally um, trying than, than uh, living in a one-bedroom apartment or splitting it with another 20-something guy. So, I, you know, I look at that. I read that article and I said, well, that's a data point. There's something wrong with that. I read another article, it's posted on the Sailor Foundation uh, blog. The California Assembly has taken up a bill to set up a, a division that would grant you accreditation or credit by simply by taking a test. And I thought maybe, I, rooting for California, hopefully there'll be a bellwether state, but if California actually allowed you to walk into a room, take a test, and prove that you actually are as smart as a person that spent $250,000 why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't they, right? I mean, it's good for the state, right? Uh, that's, uh, and that's kind of an exciting thing. I hope that passes. Uh, and then I read the third thing. This is in the article. It's David Geffen gives a $100 million scholarship to the UCLA Medical School to endow 33 scholarships. 33 people get to go to school if you have $100 million. I thought that's a pretty expensive way to buy education. Right? I mean, and you see both things, right? You see massive wealth trying to solve this problem in a conventional way, and then you see people dabbling with the unconventional way, and then you see the, the consequences of our current extremely expensive system, which is 130,000 physician shortage and, and, uh, and a bunch of impoverished students, and this is just one, but, but just about everybody I talk to that's been you know, in college or going to college has this same fear and loathing. And so, um, what do I think of it all? You know, I, I, I've always had the opinion, I mean, I had it back 13 years ago, had the opinion education should be free, and the opinion is based upon the fact that I sat in this lecture hall, a lecture hall three times as big as this, was paying the highest tuition of any institution on earth. MIT was the most expensive institution on earth in the mid-80s, I don't know what it is now, but it was then. And I watched some guy down here scribble on a whiteboard, and I didn't get to answer any questions, and I could hardly see. And I thought, this is kind of silly, right? You're going to impoverish your family and spend everything you made for the past hundred years to squint at a blackboard. It turns out the, guys, the guy scribbling on the blackboard was Walter Lewin. He's one of the greatest physics teachers you know, ever, I think. He's a brilliant guy. In 1983, he taught me physics. In 1999, he gave the same lecture, the same lecture hall, and it got recorded by someone and uploaded to YouTube. Today, in the year 2013, if you go to like Physics 101 on the sailor.org website, you'll see Walter Lewin giving those lectures. And a part of me takes a little bit of a glee in the observation that today, for free, you could have what was the most expensive thing on Earth when I was going to school. And the other part, you know, sardonically notes that, you know, uh, not much has changed in physics in a long, long time, right? Isaac Newton wrote it all down, right? So it's not like the program goes out of date. Apples still fall from the tree the way they fall from the tree. And electromagnetics works the way it works, and a Faraday cage is a Faraday cage. Um, and that just leads me to, uh, to uh, my next set of points, more technical points, the exciting things. I wrote a book called The Mobile Wave, and The Mobile Wave was really about, uh, about the, the conversion of the world from a world that revolves around software running on PCs to software running on mobile devices. And I think the last time we had, a, had an exciting uh, technology development in this world was, you know, 96 to 2000, you had the internet wave, and you had about 350 million white collar, uh, 20 to 40 year old fairly well-to-do Western workers sitting behind their computers and offices and cubicles working on software that ran, uh, that interconnected over the web protocol and ran on PCs. And now 10 years later, 13 years later, we're moving toward a world with 5 billion people. They're going to have software running on Android devices and iOS devices and perhaps, uh, perhaps a Microsoft operating system device, but probably it'll be Google and Apple slogging it out. And it'll, it'll be running on smartphones. We'll be running on watches. It'll be running on televisions, on high definition displays. It'll be running on tablet computers. It will, it will uh, be run, it'll be integrated into desktops. 
But, uh, but the significance of this, this mobile wave, is it's really creating a global wave of innovation, right? And this is, and this is a geopolitical impact. At the point that there's, there's seven billion people on the planet, one billion of them can hardly read, right? Uh, three or four billion of them are, are substantially impoverished. There's one billion, maybe two billion, that have a decent amount of wealth. Well, the, the, the global wave and the expansion of these mobile devices is bringing extremely rich, powerful software to the fingertips of everybody on Earth. And you know, it's, uh, your, your chances of mastering anything from a PC are next to zero if you can't read. On the other hand, uh, a three-year-old can master all sorts of skills on a tablet computer. Two-year-olds, four-year-olds. You know, the economist will read itself on a tablet computer. Um, the tablet computer is the best, and, and the smartphone, right? Th this phone can teach you to read, right? This, by the way, this phone, when I whip it out of my pocket in an airplay environment, I throw the image up on the screen, and it'll give you a high-definition image, and it'll talk to you. So, so we're, we're going to see a world with $100 and $200 devices from your pocket that are going to teach you to read. They'll also teach you anatomy. They'll probably teach you, a, how many of you ever, like, decipher, you know, dissected a cadaver, right? I never dissected a cadaver. Right? Normally, that's a med school thing. It's pretty expensive to dissect cadavers. But on the other hand, when you see these, uh, these Apple commercials and six-year-olds or, or eight-year-olds are sitting in a classroom watching the human cadaver get, get uh, bisected or, or, or uh, rotated or, or, um, or enhanced on, on a three-dimensional display, it really is eye-opening to you. What happens to a world where you could actually get all the courses of medical school before you're 14 years old for free? It might be a different world that we live in. Um, I, I think uh, the consequences of the mobile wave is this global wave. The global wave is a wave of, of mobile technology, primarily Western technology, American technology, rolling out of Silicon Valley. That technology on mobile devices over networks, and it's carrying a bunch of interesting things. One thing it's carrying is Western values, right? It's the, it's the Arab Spring and the Autumn Rage. You know, a girl in Pakistan who's eight years old, whose parents told her she's not allowed to go to college, when she goes to Wikipedia, Wikipedia doesn't tell her the same thing. YouTube might, she might see girls that are actually educated on the web, even though no one in her, in her village or in her family has got that education. So, so this global wave is a global wave of Western values. It's a global wave of Western language. One thing you would see if you start to do a chart, it's one of the most interesting trends is the trend of English speakers on the planet. I would predict in our lifetime, we're going to see 5 billion people speak English. China, China English is a, is a virus spreading through China. It's spreading through all of the world because if you speak English, everything is cheaper. Everything you sell, you sell more of. You can get a higher price if you can sell in English. You can get a better job. If you're a programmer and you speak English, you get paid four times as much in China as if you don't speak English. Right? I, one thing that I remember from MIT, and it's, it's indelibly inscribed on my mind is right around the time you're about to graduate, everybody starts talking about which job's going to pay you the most. And the freshmen are sitting and listening to the seniors talking. And when the seniors say, well, I'm going to go off to investment banking because it pays me an extra $8,000 a year, everybody decides investment banking is the coolest thing in the world. Right? And if computer science degrees get paid $3,000 more than the other one, then computer science becomes the coolest subject. So people get excited about what they get paid for. So the world right now is creating a market for people that can speak English, that can tap into this mobile wave. And as they speak English, all of a sudden they slip the bounds or the, the boundaries that are created by their local cultural and political institutions. I mean, maybe, maybe the opinions of your local minister about whether or not you can and cannot do something matter less than the opinions that Google or YouTube or Wikipedia have about whether you can do it, or Facebook or Twitter. And so I, I think there's a, there's a breakdown of local, uh, local commerce and local cultural affiliations. The, the local textbook manufacturer in, in Turkey is going away. Why would you ever manufacture a textbook in Turkish to teach physics? Physics works the same in Turkey as it works in the United States, right? Whoever, whoever wins the uh, Western market the Western bloc, with regard to software, is going to win the rest of the world. 
So what we have is, is we've got uh, the EU that's come together with America, with Canada, with Australia, with the English-speaking South Africans, with all the English-speaking Indians, and with all the global multinationals, all of which have adopted English as a language. That creates a billion-person-plus trading block of middle-class consumers. That billion-person middle-class trading block, they have all the money. They probably have 75 to 80 percent of the money to buy any software or to acquire any services. Nobody else is close. I mean, the next best might be something in, in, in Chinese language for the Chinese middle class, which maybe it amounts to 200 million. But, but creating software for 200 million Chinese is, is not going to help you win over the billion people that want to learn in English. And that being the case, it's inevitable that, that networks of intelligence coming out of the Western bloc are going to spill over to the entire world, and you're going to see networks that first hit critical mass of a billion people, and then they'll go to five billion people because the variable cost to do whatever they do for the next four to five billion people is just the cost of electricity and the servers. And where do we see that now? Um, we see that with Facebook. That's a billion-person social network. We see that with Google, another billion-person intelligence network. We're, we're seeing networks like, like uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Right? All these things are forming. They're all forming in the U.S. You're not seeing Chinese and Japanese networks that are leaping uh, here to, to invade the turf of the West. I mean, how, how many of you really want to go to a, a, a Japanese website to get an answer to a question? Right? Not likely. In fact, in fact uh, most uh, other cultures are a bit handicapped just because of, of all the cultural conventions of the students you know, as they're coming up through the educational system. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, at, at, you know, if I look at it commercially, what I'm expecting is I'm expecting more Googles and more Facebooks, but I expect uh, global health networks, right? What happens when someone can monitor your heartbeat and monitor, monitor your, uh, your um, uh, oxygen level in your blood and use it to predict an incoming heart attack, and they can do it off of a $20 device that wraps around your arm that links into an Android and iPhone? when there's five billion smartphones on the planet. For an extra $20, you're going to get health care? Of course you're going to take that. Someone's going to run that network. It's not going to be a Japanese company. right? It's, it's, it's probably not going to be a Chinese company. Likely, it's not going to be any company that, do, that isn't full of executives, marketers, and engineers that are fluent in English. Th those companies are, are going to have a massive crushing advantage in selling the rest of the world. You're not going to uh, you're not going to compete successfully with a company like that if you're coming out of Argentina or Turkey or Pakistan. It's going to be very very challenging. On the other hand, you're going to want to buy that stuff, or you're going to want to access it somehow. So I think we'll see we'll see many many of these networks that, that form as part of the global wave, and and we're going to and and we're going to see an unprecedented era of global trade, because all this is trade by another word. At the point that, that uh, someone in China is going online to Wikipedia to get an answer, that's a, that's a trade of one sort or the other. At the point that anybody puts an ad on a Facebook page that gets accessed by someone outside the U.S., there's another form of trade. So I, I think we'll, we'll see that continue. And uh, what does that mean to education? I think we're going to see the formation of global education networks. Right. In, a, in a manner of speaking, right, you could say that uh, iTunes University and YouTube are Google and Apple's uh, you know, half-completed global education network. Right? They're, they're amorphous in, in many ways, and they're, they're not very precise. But I think, I think there'll be more until somebody cracks that code. But, and I don't know if it's a single company to become the network, or I don't know if it's many, many different. Uh, organizations that, that create global networks, but it seems to me that that um, there's a billion people on the planet can't read, and we can't afford. We we have not figured out how to be able to afford to teach them to read in ten thousand years. So digital has got to be the answer, and prob and and putting a piece of software onto a smartphone or a tablet computer that gets down to the hundred dollar price point is probably going to be the answer. And once you teach them to read, then you can teach them K through 12, and then you can teach them 
a, a college degree, and then you can teach them a PhD. And uh, I, I've said I've said before to other people. I mean, I think we don't need another hundred thousand algebra teachers, right? Al algebra Euclidean algebra is twenty five hundred years old. We've, you know, the definition of insanity is you just continue to do the same thing over and over again without ever getting any better, without ever achieving any result. It, you know, the guy that taught algebra in the year 400 BC worked about as hard as the person that taught me algebra, you know, geometry. These things are, they're, they're, uh, they're stuck in a rut. We're much better off to have a piece of software that runs a billion times a day to do that. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that's where we get the digital technology. It seems pretty clear to me that uh, there are going to be breakthroughs in the next 10 years, and there are breakthroughs even now, in, uh, in software technology for education, for authentication, and for certification. And, and for those in the industry, I think they get this. For those not in the industry, I think the elephant in the room that, that people don't want to really want to come to grips with is We've reached an inflection point where there's a whole set of skills where, where you can probably prove scientifically that software running on a, a, a smartphone or software running on a tablet does a better job than a human being dedicated to your child, right? Especially in areas of science and technology and engineering. So the irony is there's a, all, all these people talk about STEM. We need more science, technology, and engineering students and things like uh, teachers, et cetera, they're totally missing the boat. We don't really need to, to create more science, technology, and engineering teachers. What we need to do is create programs that run on, on computing devices that do all those tasks. If there's anything that you ought to be able to teach with a computer program, it ought to be math, right? There's, there's, there's no subjectivity to math. There's a right answer. There's a wrong answer. I mean, you might be able to convince me that that uh, whether or not I dance the ballet well is a subjective thing, and maybe synchronized swimming might be subjective, and maybe even composing a symphony or playing the saxophone, or even maybe surgery might be subjective a bit. But there's nothing subjective about geometry and calculus, you know, and, and, and differential equations. There's just a, there, there's a, a better way to teach it maybe and a worse way to teach it, but at the end of the day, the, the proof is in, uh, is in the certification if the student can spend 37 minutes and master all of the techniques using my computer program, and it takes them 37 days with the teacher, then I can prove that my computer program worked better. And of course, my computer program worked for zero. I think, um, I think uh, many people's eyes are going to open as they start to see uh, some of the more creative things you can do with a smartphone. I mean, for example, right? Um, I can give you a test. Uh, where I ask you things about art history and with the goal of determining whether or not you've gone and looked at every single piece of art in Europe with your own eyes. But I could tell you, take the smartphone and go look at every single piece of art in Europe with your own eyes and snap a photo of it and geotag it, and then you could prove it, right? If, if I can tie you to the phone, if, if I, I can give you a, a, a test to see whether or not you uh, have mastered certain physical skills, I could also put a piece of software on a phone that could monitor your heart rate every minute of the day for the, for the last eight years. And I can see whether or not you know how to drive your heart rate to 70% of max, 80% of max, 90% of max, 95% of max. Exactly. Right? People are using these things to look at people's golf swings. Right? At the point that uh, you can uh, take a photo, you, how do you know whether someone knows how to sail a boat? Right? If, I, if I actually took a mobile device out and it was keeping track of, of uh, elevations and wind and temperature and sunlight and, and, and trajectory and course over ground and the speed, right? I, it's, a very, it's a very interesting uh, opportunity to certify that you actually can do something or certify that you did something. Or Right now, I can authenticate that you showed up. Right, If you take a test, an SAT test, the joke is... I have some rich friends, you know, and uh, some of them are, are rich uh, New Yorkers. And they kind of laugh about the SAT because they joke, well, if you have enough money, you just go hire someone to take it for you. It never occurred to me to hire someone to take it for me. Of course, I never have money to hire anybody to take it for me. But there's a whole generation of people that grew up rich kids, and they just hired someone to go take the test for them. Now, if you put someone's student ID on their phone, you could walk into the, to the testing center, take a photo of your test, and seal it digitally. 
and then it's not possible for someone to actually go take that test for you. There's a, so there's um, a lot of new opportunities to prove that you did what you were supposed to do. There's, you, ever, you guys ever use cut the rope? Anybody? You know, I studied uh, mechanical engineering at MIT. Cut the rope has, uh, it has rotational physics in it, and it's got tension and torque, and, uh, and it's got uh, energy exchange, and it teaches you a lot of mechanical engineering and, and physics concepts. Six-year-olds start playing with this game on the iPad, and they make you go through different levels. And by the time you get through the 197th level, right, you understand all those mechanical engineering concepts better than any professor at MIT could certify you understand them. There's no written test I could give you that would certify you understand those concepts as well as an interactive test that, that forces you to do this and this and this and this with a 300 millisecond delay. Just like, how do you give someone a written test to see if they can play the saxophone? Right? There's no way to do that, right? I mean, you've got to play the saxophone. Well, computers are allowing us to, to, to play things uh, and to draw things. And as the computers get smarter, I think they get smarter at certifying. So I, I think uh, at some point, we'll see, a, we'll see a number of tipping points or inflection points where the general public and the general politician and the general adult and general parent says, this is not like a faddish, goofy, interesting thing to do for my kid. It turns out the digital software running on mobile devices may in fact or probably teaches better. And if it doesn't, I can create a piece of software that'll do a better job of teaching you than the teacher. Given a choice between Aristotle dedicated to my kid for 18 years or a tablet computer, dedicated to, uh, dedicated to uh, my child, I, I think that sometime in the next decade, we'll get to the point where the tablet computer would do a better job than the, the smartest man in the world did for Alexander the Great. Right? That's an inflection point. So software is going to teach better, and it's going to certify better. There, when, when, when you have to prove that you know something, you could certify that someone can program a computer using a piece of software to, to get, you give them a task to program, they have to program it, it works or it doesn't work. Now where it gets interesting is, okay, so you're the top one of 50 people in your class, who cares? You're, you're maybe top 2%. You know, we all know if you want to actually make a meaningful contribution at, uh, at Google or at Apple or at Microsoft, you've got to be better than the top 2%. You are probably got to be the top 0.02%. And there's a point, you know, if, if you look at some of these things, right, like, uh, Look at Apple Maps and Google Earth, right? The, the, the two best programs are so much better than every other thing ever created in the history of man that you're just not going to bother with programs 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's, a, it's really a winner take on thing. The guy that figures out the best is going to get 987 million users, at which point the guy that figures out the second best or the third best probably isn't in business. So we don't really need people just to be top 2%. We need them to be ultra, ultra, ultra skilled at what they do. And here's where the MOOCs come in, right? I mean, if you can train a million people in a course and a million people take a test, you can actually select out the one in a million with a computer. No human being can do that. There's no institution on earth that knows how to pick the one out of a million. But a computer can find the one out of a million. And I think that creates a new type of credential Right? If, if you could actually show that you were the smartest person in all of China this year in a given area, that would be an interesting credential. You could monetize that. Right? And, th and that's why I think, I think education really is destined to be free. It ought to be free. The only real debate here is, and by the way, the reason it ought to be free from a philosophical underpinning is, is education is only a benefit to the rest of the society. Right? If you're educated and you can make a, a contribution to civilization, that's good for everybody. So it's foolish for us to deprive the people uh, that are growing up of education because they're going to become a liability if they're not educated. What we need is 100,000 people with 100,000 different PhDs, hopefully each one of them an expert in solving a disease that might kill me. That's what I want. I don't want 100,000 algebra teachers. I want 100,000 people to solve 100,000 diseases, each one of which is vying to kill me. That's how I'm going to live forever. I need to solve the 100,000 health care problems. Algebra is not going to kill me. 
and algebra is not going to save me either. When I'm 72 years old and I have the brain tumor, algebra is not going to save me. It's not helpful. That's not what I need. That's not what anybody needs. So it comes back, it comes back to this primary point. Education is destined to be free. It ought to be free. You can give it away, and you can f the government could finance it, and that's one reasonable approach. The Chinese and the Indian governments have, have you know, every reason to want to finance it. You look at this thing. So David Geffen gives $100 million for 33 people to go to medical school? Well, why not the state of California give $100 million to give everybody that wants to go to medical school a free medical school education? Seems like a much better idea. Uh, that $100 million will buy you a lot more software than it will buy you conventional medical uh, education. So if not California giving away for free, then China or India. The Indians have 1 billion people, 982 million people with a mobile phone. You got a billion people out there need an education. You got 800 million of them that are not in the middle class and they have no hope of getting in the middle class without an education. It needs to be a specialized one. So it could be, it could be a government, it may not be. Lord knows the government spends enough money on education but it's all, it's all pretty much a jobs program being funneled to expensive institutions, expensive teachers, expensive conventional techniques, some of which, by the way, is valuable. I'm not disputing the value of, of uh, conventional education. I had a conventional education. But, but the real point is the great majority of it, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of all this money the government's spending is being poured down a drain because it's being inefficiently used. And we're at the beginning of a new S curve where you can make a difference. Um, and the other, the other possibility is, is advertising. I think, I think Google or Apple or Facebook, any of those are in a perfect situation. Why not just give away complete free education on every subject to anybody and just ad finance it? What's, what's it cost to hire 400 professors, put everything they have or they know into software and give it away to a billion people? I mean, if you, if you spent a billion dollars a year on it, well, a billion dollars is what Apple makes every, like, week or something. Right, if, if Apple diverted two weeks' worth of earnings, they could spend a billion dollars and they could provide a comprehensive, focused education to everybody on the planet. How about with every single iPhone, you get a free college degree and a Ph.D.? Or how about with every Android device, we also give you a Ph.D.? That's a pretty good business model. Right? I mean, if, if you want to give away other things, why not give away that? So that's another possibility. I met with Mikesh Ambani. He's rolling out Reliance Industries, tech, a Reliance Network. You could bundle it into the telephone network. Right? And that's an idea he had. And, uh, and then finally, you could, you could justify and run the entire thing just as a recruiting network. Right? If, if you actually gave away education, who wants it? The 7 billion people on the planet between the ages of 0 and 18, 0 and 22, they want education. If the average person lives to age 75, that means any given time, 2 billion people want education, right? So, that, so there's an obvious built-in demand for a network that runs for 2 billion people simultaneously. Um, so in that case, what if you actually were able to certify and rank sort all 2 billion people across 1,000 different disciplines? You know, let people opt into what they want to be certified for, their golf, sport spring, or their golf swing, their English skills, their whatever skills, their heart rate skills, their physical fitness, their math skills, their programming skills, their medical skills. There's a lot of things you could certify. If you actually ran that network and just kept that database, if you could authenticate the people, then uh, you could make the money back just on headhunter fees. I, I this week, I spent $150,000 this week in the last seven days on headhunter fees. Me, running a small little company. I have 3,500 employees. I spent $100,000 a week on headhunter fees. We hire someone, we pay $25,000 to a headhunter. You know what? You know what I paid the guy for? He gave me an uncertified resume. And I gave him $25,000. And, and, you know, statistically, 20% of the stuff on the resume is all a lie anyway. So, so how do you think I'd feel if somebody showed up and they said, well, I got a list of like 800,000 computer scientists from India, and I can give you the top 1%, the top 0.1%, or the top 0.01%. Now, you could securitize that market in a different way. I mean, really, literally securitize the market. 
at the point that you can certify someone can speak English and program and in the top 0.1%. And by the way, if they can, um, if they can uh, go through a course of 537 difficult business problems and complete that in one hour 37 minutes, and you can certify that for me, then I would pay for that. I'd pay money for that. And by the time you calculate the amount of money people spend on headhunting fees, I bet the revenues of the headhunting industry would, would probably pay the cost of providing a free digital education for everybody on the planet. I bet. So I don't say all this stuff to criticize anybody because the truth of the matter is we're all in this together. I mean, I don't know whether I'm supposed to blame the state or the college or the city or the government or myself or the nonprofit establishment or Google or Apple or Facebook or the headhunters or the newspapers, whoever it is, or the, exi or the traditional institutions of higher education or community colleges, any one of them, right, might with some inspired focus solve the problem, especially the bigger ones, right? Any one of the top 30 countries on earth could solve the problem by themselves. Any one of the top 30 companies could solve the problem, right? Perhaps, and, uh, no, yeah, maybe I'm being too simplistic here. When I say solve the problem, I don't mean solve all problems. I mean get us to the point where the civilization agrees that it is now technically feasible to educate someone for a variable cost of electricity. That's what I mean. At that point, the dam will break and will move from a traditional conventional technique, which is put 30 people in a room with one person and let the one person talk to the 30 people and give them whatever we give them to a new technique, which is let's, let's give every single person on the planet a $300 mobile device plugged into information, which is free to them, and let's let them all go as fast as they want to go, as far as they want to go to achieve whatever is their intellectual potential. You know, it's t it turned out, uh, you know, I never got a PhD, and I'll never know whether I could have got a PhD, but I didn't have the money to get a PhD. <laughs> I mean I, could, I mean, I couldn't afford to get the undergraduate degree. How am I going to find out whether I'm qualified to have a PhD in physics? Right? When it's, there are a lot of classes at MIT. You know what they say? They say, you're not allowed to register for this class if you're an undergraduate. Right? We live in a world of, even if the government of the United States gave infinite money to MIT, they were still going to ration my access to graduate classes. And rightfully so, because they can't have 300 people flood a class where you need a pupil-teacher ratio of 10 to 1, right? I, I couldn't walk into a medical school at Harvard and cross-register to take any class just because I thought it was a good idea in the conventional uh, regime. But what might happen, right? What, what happens in a world where anybody can go as fast as they want? I, like, I, use, um, I use the analogy of uh, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, how many people have been to San Francisco? They've seen those bridges. They're like, are they not awesome wonders of the world? You look at that and you're like, you couldn't make that yourself. You couldn't make that with everybody in the room. You couldn't make that with everybody you know in your school. You look at it and, and you, you know, you think different things as you get older. But here's what I think when I look at that bridge. I think that was an awesome, probably the most awesome undertaking, you know, in that city's history. And, and integral, essential to the development of that region of the country. And you couldn't do it without the right architect. And they did it 100 years ago. Now, how many people on the face of the earth were qualified to architect that bridge or, or run that engineering project 100 years ago? Well, you got to wonder, what was their design selection pool? How big was it? I mean, when they were recruiting for, or, or selecting architects, did they have five choices? Did they have 50? Do you think there were 500 people on Earth that could have done that job 100 years ago? I doubt it, right? It's, it's very unlikely. You would have had to come from a rich family and a privileged upbringing. You would have had to be sent at extreme cost. But it's hard to make that bridge, right? Most of us still can't make that bridge, correct? Very hard to make a bridge like that. You would have had to go to the best uh, school on Earth and had the best teaching, and then you would have had to have incredible amounts of assets thrown at you, and you would have had to have been nurtured over time until you understood how this all worked. And then you're probably one of seven people, and they probably had seven choices, or five choices, and they picked one, and they succeeded. And you know, and everywhere else on Earth where they didn't have those choices, well, they didn't get their bridge. 
And here's what I think. I think, what if we actually simulated uh, bridge building in a program, put it on an iPad, and gave it away to a billion people? And what if it turns out that the best designer of bridges on Earth is an 11-year-old girl in Pakistan who it doesn't even get to go to high school, who's been told by her parents she's not going to go to college, right? who certainly doesn't have the money to go off to MIT or, or Stanford or anywhere else and learn civil engineering. What if that's the best person on Earth? Because it's possible, right? I mean, uh, genetics is this roll of a dice. You don't know where the geniuses are. They could be anywhere. You know, they tell stories about, about the great, you know, what, what Mozart did when he was four years old and what Gauss did when he was four years old. Right? It's, it's possible that we've actually given some uh, genetic incredible uh, fortune to some kid in, in the middle of a peasant village in China or in the middle of India, or maybe they're sitting in a middle-class family anywhere and they're being deprived of that opportunity. I, I was offered a chance to learn a, a language when I was 14 years old, and my choice was French or German or Latin. Those are my choices. I came from probably one of the 3% most affluent places on earth. So if you're in the top 3 or 4% and you got a choice of two languages at age 14, by the way, at an age at which it made no difference which I chose because I wouldn't master either, right? I was going to get taught in a class of mediocre learners by a mediocre teacher. No offense to them, but that's just the way it is. I think about that and I say, what is the chance that I was going to excel in that discipline? And I think, uh, I think digital education offers us, it offers us an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity. It's all coming very, very fast right now. And if I had to summarize it down, it's, it's if it doesn't exist somewhere on earth today, we can create software that will educate most subjects better than the way it's being done in, with conventional technique. We can create software to authenticate someone's identity and, and to certify both their skill and their participation. If we haven't done it now, we will do it. Some things are simple and brainless and obvious, like algebra and geometry and calculus. Some things will require some thinking, you know, medical techniques engineering techniques. But it's, it's, it's clear, the writing is on the wall, that we should be investing in the software technology to do this and not investing in uh, the conventional techniques that have, we've been used for the past 2,000 years to do these things. I was in with one more observation. Um, I went to MIT because I wanted to design spaceships. And I was, I was fascinated by aerospace. And the reason why is because from 1903 to 1969, you had a, just an incredible, extreme uh, explosion in technology capability. That, you know, that S-curve that went from not being able to fly to the Wright brothers flying at a few miles an hour to us walking on the moon. Right? That's, that was an incredible achievement. And then you know what happened next? By the, right about then, right when I'm coming of age in the 70s, everybody's like high on the euphoria of breakthroughs in aerospace technology. And, uh, and that momentum carried over, and, and my thinking was formed in the 70s. And I decided I had, to go to, I had to go to MIT, I had to get an aerospace degree, I had to design spaceships, I had to go to Mars. That was my thinking. You know, and I went to MIT, and I studied aerospace engineering, and uh, I went from 83 to 87. In 86, the space shuttle blew up, Right, the entire industry stalled out, but that was just a that was just a, a symptom of the problem. The big problem is we hit a technology wall in aerospace engineering around the mid 70s. The space shuttle was designed in the mid in the 70s. It's 70s type equipment. If you look at the design of a, a Gulf Stream 5, it's the same as a Gulf Stream 4. It's the same as a Gulf Stream 3. It's the same as a Gulf Stream 2 which is designed in the 70s based on the fuselage of the Gulf Stream 1. Right? For the most part, a Boeing business jet is a 737, was designed in the 70s. Right? That, all that technology, it, it hit a plateau in the 70s. For the last 40 years, the way that airplanes work, the way that rockets work, the way that most of these aerospace technologies work, hasn't materially changed that much. You could put every one, you could put $100 billion into this problem, you're not going to change the way it works. You could put a trillion dollars in the problem. You're not going to change the way it works. Until we come up with some breakthrough in propulsion, 
something which is 10 times or 100 times faster, then there isn't, there isn't any exciting future for the human race based upon an investment in aerospace and a career in aerospace. And on the other hand, if you look at the smartphone, right, this is a thousand times more compact computing power than the, than, uh, the Apple computer that we used 12 years ago. This is a thousand times better. And, and we all thought the computer revolution was dead and buried and over it 12 years ago. And my point is this stuff, this stuff is, is where the opportunity is. If you have to decide where you're going to spend your life energy and your capital, right, you put, put it at a place where you've got some leverage. And there's leverage right now in digital education primarily because nobody is bothered to exploit the opportunity yet with serious amounts of capital. Everybody's been waiting. And, and now you've got all these things coming together. You've got the fast networks. You've got the light computational devices. You've got mobile devices. You've got, you've got mobile operating systems that are, that are extraordinary. that are 10x better than anything we had 10 years ago. The combination of all those things with, with the massive uh, networks of, of uh, content, like uh, the books that Google has scanned, you know, and, uh, and the, the video that's, uh, that's now stored online on YouTube, all those things are creating an opportunity. But it really is just that. It's an opportunity. It's not a realized uh, benefit to society yet, not a result yet. It's like we're, we're just knocking at the door. You can see, you can see little, little uh, sparks, little sparks of success. You see the Khan Academies. You know, you see the big MOOCs. You see, uh, you see people that are relying upon Wikipedia. You see the spark that is YouTube. So you see where the world wants to go, but uh, no organization, no institutions put it all together yet. At the point that they have, then I think you'll unleash a virus, an education virus, and, and we will start to see something or some group of things that start to spin up to, uh, to 100,000 people in the network, then a million people in the network, then 10 million people in the network, then 100 million people in the network. And then it'll become a self-sufficient living creature because it'll generate revenues from advertising or from government or from sponsorship or from usage or from commerce or something. And it'll, it'll start to grow the way Google has grown or the way Apple has grown. Again, maybe it will be Apple. Maybe it will be Google, right? I, I don't know what it'll be at all. It, there is no future, but, you know, that which we make for ourselves in this area, right? Anything could happen. It's possible to have the best assets on earth and screw it up. Right? There's, a, there's a whole litany of companies, right? The most successful company in all of Europe in the year 2000 was Nokia. And they've driven themselves to zero. So you can take a great set of assets and take them to zero. You can take a non-set of assets. I mean, who would have believed that Wikipedia was going to become you know, the, the non-fictional uh, body of reference for the entire world? Right? You can start with nothing, and you can go to something huge. And there's everything in the middle. I, I have a healthy respect for the complexity of the problem. So I, I don't think there's a simple solution. I'm sure that it's not going to come about uh, without lots of different organizations interacting in lots of sophisticated fashion. And maybe there's a dozen winners or a thousand winners in this market. I don't know. But um, what I do know, uh, what I'm quite sure of is, is it's pregnant right now. 12 years ago, 13 years ago, we were missing a lot of, a lot of key technologies. But right now, if you look at, the, look at the reaction of politicians, and you look at the reaction of the people that run these institutions, and you look at the reaction of the people in the education establishment, and if, and if you look at the, at the reaction of students, you know, 30 years ago, students were told it's going to be expensive to go to college, whatever, and they put their head down, and they shook it, and they just agreed in, in, in a resigned fashion. They just weren't going to go to college, or they're going to go to community college, or they were going to take eight years, or they weren't going to get a medical degree, or they weren't going to get a grad degree, and they accepted it. Today, there's a lot of indignation, like, why the hell do I have to pay that much money for that? Why do you charge me that much? Parents saying, why do I got to write a $200,000 check? Why do I have to do that? Students saying, why do I leave school with so much debt? So, so I think, I think uh, you're at a point where the customer realizes there's a better, a better way. The industry realizes there's a better way. Politicians, governors I talk to, they realize there's a better way. Everybody can see that technology is going to change this. So there's, there's enough light in the tunnel for people to want to 
stretch and take a risk, and yet everybody's still looking you know, for the map through the tunnel. <laughs> Everybody wants someone to help them through it. And uh, I think the people in this room are uniquely uh, suited to do that. You can help provide some guide path to the people with either power or need or opportunity so as to make a, a better world. And um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for all coming. I hope everybody gets what they're looking for at the conference. I hope when we leave, uh, there are a lot of uh, very constructive relationships that have been formed and partnerships. And in and, and, and the ideal world, uh, we're all more effective and more successful because of each other. And uh, that's what this is all about. So thank you.